you'll hear a telephone conversation. Now you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs forty-five dollars per night. It provides air conditioning and shower, and a waterfront room costs eighty dollars per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged twelve and below, the cost is ten dollars per night for the guest house room and fifteen dollars for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court, or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges eight dollars each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs four dollars per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions seven to ten. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. Great! Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A L B U R Y, at six hundred and forty-eight Dean Street, New South Wales. Six four eight Dean Street, D E A N. Is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know, Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much, but it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about canoeing. Now you have half a minute to read questions 11 to 20.
Listen to the tape carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Have you imagined paddling around on a river in a small boat? Canoes which are narrow boats, and usually hold one or two people at the most, are particularly well known for being unstable and turning over in the water. But more and more people enjoy this dangerous sport. Today, Cynthia Bocci, an adult education teacher and an addict of canoeing as well, will share her experience of canoeing with us. Cynthia, when did you begin this sport? Well, I started it six or seven years ago, and soon I got attracted by the exercise. I have to admit that it brings me great fun. It's become part of my life. So, could you describe how you do it? At first, I think you need some like-minded friends. The friends who share the same interest with you. It's no fun at all if you canoe alone. Usually, we assemble in a parking shelter near the Island Lake Recreation Area. We pull our canoes from inside the vans, lift them from atop the cars and trucks, and attach wheels to help transport them to the shores of the lake beside the boat dock. What equipment do you need for the sport? Well, first and foremost, a canoe, of course. The price ranges from £300 to £700, depending on the material they're made from. The more you can pay, the better, really. Personally, I wouldn't look at anything under £500, but that obviously depends on your budget. You also need a hard helmet to protect yourself against rocks when you fall out of the canoe, and believe me, that is very likely to happen. Because of this, it's a must for a beginner to wear a wetsuit. Oh, bathing suits don't work, really. Sometimes a life jacket is a necessity, in case you fall into water and no one else is nearby. Maybe many can't understand your passion for the dangerous sport. Do you think it's all worth it? Absolutely. I just love it. It's exciting, exhilarating, yet it's peaceful and it's calm. You can work as hard as you want to, or you can take it easy. In addition to having fun, canoeing offers a workout without realising you're working out. Besides being a great exercise, which is good to heart and lungs, you gain strength and mobility. You build strength not only by paddling, but also from lifting and carrying your canoes. You can also exercise your mobility. Frankly, I never had upper body strength until I started canoeing. Now I can pick my canoe up and carry it on my shoulder with no problem. However, it's not just a workout of the upper body, but also a total body workout, if you're doing it correctly. It's a great calorie burner. And more important to me, paddling isn't strictly about exercise. It's as much about the peace and relaxation that comes from being out on the water. I saw it described on a brochure as liquid medicine for the soul, and that is so accurate. It allows you to take a mental break from your ordinary routine. It's a lot of fun, and you meet a lot of great people. We connect on the waterways by responding to email invitations, posting on websites and club announcements. Also, it's a great way to get an up-close view of nature. You can sneak up on wildlife. I've been right next to ducks, deer, and all kinds of birds. You just get a different view than you can get on land. I especially enjoy camping by canoe. It's like backpacking without having to carry a pack on your back. You can put everything you need in the hatches of the canoe. Have you experienced this kind of camping? Well, whatever you say about this sport, it's never dull. I think on one level it's a serious activity and you can become a real champion, but it's a small group who take it that far. But for most it's a fantastic sport for anyone who likes adventure. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. 
In this section, you'll hear a conversation between a tutor and a student about the strategies of note taking. Now you have half a minute to read questions 21 to 29. Listen to the tape carefully and answer questions 21 to 29. Hi, Mr. Smith. I wonder whether you can spare several minutes with me. Sure. What's your name, please? John Murray. Good, John. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I am a freshman in the communication faculty. I quite enjoy the life here, except for the difficulty I have in the lectures. You know, I find it difficult to take notes when I listen. If I take notes on my notebook, I can't concentrate on the lecture. But I feel frustrated after the lecture if I don't write down anything. As we know, note-taking is a complex activity which requires a high level of ability in many separate skills. At least four important skills are needed. Four? I don't expect so many! I think that needs one or two skills. Firstly, you have to understand what the lecturer says as he says it. That means you should try to develop the ability to infer the meaning of unfamiliar words from the context. You cannot stop the lecture in order to look up a new word or check an unfamiliar sentence pattern. Yes, that puts the non-native speaker like me under a particular severe strain. Often I may not be able to recognise words in speech, which I understand straight away in print. So the ability of inferring is important. Of course, you won't always be able to do this successfully. You must not allow failure of this kind to discourage you, however. It's often possible to understand much of a lecture by concentrating solely on those points which are most important. But how do I decide what's important? Well, that's in itself another skill I'd like to tell you. At first, the most important piece of information in a lecture is the title itself. If this is printed or referred to beforehand, you should study it carefully and make sure you're in no doubt about its meaning. A title often implies many of the major points that will later be covered in the lecture itself. It should help you therefore to decide what the main point of the lecture will be. Besides the title, what should I pay attention to during the speech? A good lecturer often signals what's important or unimportant. He may give direct or indirect signals. Many lecturers, for example, explicitly tell their audience that a point is important and that the student should write it down. Unfortunately, some lecturers who are trying to establish a friendly relationship with the audience are likely on these occasions to employ a colloquial style. He might say such thing as, This is, of course, the crunch, or perhaps you'd like to get it down. Although this will help the student who's a native English speaker, it may very well cause difficulty for the non-native speaker. You'll therefore have to make a big effort to get used to the various styles of his lectures. I see. You mean I should get used to some colloquial expressions of the lecturer and write down the points he recommends us to take? That's right. And it's worth remembering that most lecturers also give indirect signals to indicate what's important. They either pause or speak slowly or speak loudly or use a greater range of intonation. Or they employ a combination of these devices when they say something important. So... I should be aware of this and focus my attention accordingly. If I can catch the main points, how can I write them quickly and clearly? Good question. That's a problem that most students find hard to solve. Having sorted out the main points, you have to write them down. In order to write at speed, you may find it helps to abbreviate. You can also try to select only those words which give maximum information. 
There are usually nouns, but sometimes verbs or adjectives. Writing only one point on each line also helps you to understand your notes when you come to read them later. I see. The last but not least skill to learn is to show the connections between the various points you've noted. This can often be done more effectively by a visual presentation than by a lengthy statement in words. Thus, the use of spacing. Of underlining and of conventional symbols plays an important part in efficient note taking. In this way, you can see at a glance the framework of the lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. I think I'll employ the methods in the next lecture. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture about searching on the internet. Now you have half a minute to read questions thirty to forty. Listen to the tape carefully and answer questions eleven to twenty. Morning, everyone. I think all of you are so familiar with the use of the internet. After email, it's likely that the most frequent online activity is searching. For better or worse, the days of thumbing through pages of a dictionary, looking up in an encyclopedia for information, are out of date. It's so much easier to just Google it. First. Do you know how Google works and search what you are looking for? To start with, Spider Software, a module in the search engine, crawls web, finds, fetches pages, and follows links to other pages. Then Indexer sorts words on every page Spider finds and stores an index of words in a huge database. For example. When you submit a query as Mount Everest, the search engine checks index and gets each page that contains Mount Everest. It stores pages using PageBank and decides which are likely to be most valuable. Usually, the most relevant pages are returned first. You can see that Google is not the only search utility in town. But it comes with such a formidable collection of tools to focus your search on that it is the engine of choice for many of us. The trick to efficient Google searches is mastering its tools to get what you want faster and more easily. Following are nine tricks to do just that. At first, you should know how to find similar terms. You thought the tilde character served no useful purpose, didn't you? But when you insert the tilde in front of a search term, Google will retrieve sources matching the word as well as synonyms. Do not leave a space between the tilde and the search term. Then, do you know how to exclude terms? It's also as important a trick as finding terms. Sometimes a keyword will come up with items totally unrelated to the subject you're interested in. For example, when you research plasma in the cosmos, you would type in the word plasma and be forced to wade through plenty of sites referring to plasma televisions. The fastest way to solve this is to use the exclude function, the hyphen. Type plasma hyphen TV. That is P L A S M A hyphen TV, and you will eliminate many irrelevant sites. Are you usually made fun of by friends about your poor memory? Don't worry, they exaggerate. Sometimes you need to look up a quotation for which you can't recall all the words. 
No problem. Use asterisks to stand in for missing words. Sometimes when you translate or compose essays, you need to know the synonyms at a large scale. Of course, Webster Dictionary helps you efficiently, but you can now get definitions in a flash by typing define and your search word. You'll come up with definitions, synonyms, and links for further information. Now, how to find lost pages. A wonderful feature of Google search is the cache option. In virtually all search results, you'll see a link to cached versions of pages you're looking for. You usually won't need to refer to these archival pages, but if your search ever turns up an old news page, for instance, you may find that when you click on the link, the page no longer exists, even though it turned up in the search results. In that event, simply click on the cache link, which is at the bottom line of the search result, and that will retrieve the last saved version of the page that had failed to show. This is a powerful, extremely helpful tool when you come across old pages from websites that no longer exist or are no longer maintained. Do you want to get numbers or names? Looking up a phone number? Just type the name and city or state initials of the person whose number you're looking for. The number will pop up instantly. If you have a phone number but want the name or the location, just type in the number, no hyphens, parenthesis or space necessary. For fun, type in 202-456-1111 and see whose office this number belongs to. Did you know you can search for pictures with Google? Just go to the Google homepage, click on images and type in what you're looking for. You can narrow your searches using the advanced search function to, for example, retrieve certain types or sizes of files. Finally, you can simplify all your searches by uniting the Google search bar into your browser. Go to google.com, click More, scroll down the page to Google Tools, then click on Toolbar and follow directions from there. And of course, some of these tools will work with other search engines too. Experiment and see which ones work best for you. You'll find a wonderful world, I'm sure. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.